Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Systems for Action Research and Progress webinar series. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, for those of you who may be new uh, to the Systems for Action program uh, or, this, or this webinar series, um, let me say welcome, and uh, I'll tell you just a, a little bit about uh, the program. Systems for Action is a, um, uh, uh, one of the signature research programs of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and our program studies ways of aligning medical, social, and public health systems in ways that can improve health and health equity. Um, we uh, sponsor a growing constellation of research, progress, uh, research studies that rigorously test mechanisms for aligning medical, social, and, and public health systems, both delivery and financing systems, with the goal of producing more evidence about how to achieve a culture of health and health equity uh, by building stronger connections uh, across, across sectors and systems that influence health. Uh, we do this research and, prog research and progress webinar series um, on a regular schedule about twice a month, um, where we feature uh, one or more of our research progress, uh, research studies, um, and give uh, research teams a chance to uh, to update the field on what they're learning uh, through their um, through their projects and their their studies. Really, at, at any stage of the research project uh, of the research continuum, from from the design of the study through um, implementation, uh, analysis, interpretation, and in, very importantly, translation of research findings in, into action. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today's Research in Progress uh, webinar, um, we're actually going to feature some research that, that are, that's being done by our, um, by our internal team in the, the National Program Office that's based here uh, at University of Colorado. So, uh, so I will be your speaker for today, uh, um, Glenn Mays. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm here at the uh, Colorado School of Public Health, and I've got the pleasure of directing the uh, National Program Office for the Systems for Action uh, program. Um, in terms of the agenda for today, I'll spend a little bit of time stepping you through one of our uh, one of our strands of research that we lead um, by our internal team here in Colorado, uh, and um, what we're learning specifically around hospitals and their involvement in multi-sector community networks. Um, I'll um, make sure to allow time for questions and comments at the end of today's session. So if you are, if you have a um, question or a comment and you're with us, you're connected through the online uh, component, the web-based component of today's webinar, uh, you should be able to see a chat box and you can type your question or comment into that chat box uh, at any time during, um, during the webinar today. And um, my colleagues, um, uh, Chris Lytle and Carrington Lott will help me keep an eye on that chat box and we'll make sure that we've got time toward the end of today's session to, to um, address those, those questions and, and comments. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll also note that we do, um, we record these um, research in progress webinars and post them on our website uh, after, after each event. So um, if you're not able to stay all the way through or you've got colleagues that aren't with us that you think might be interested, you can direct them to our website at systemsforaction.org. Um, under the events tab, you'll see uh, the link to the Research in Progress webinar series, and you can see both a schedule of upcoming webinars and uh, our archived and recorded webinar sessions um, are up there as well. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some research that we have underway. <clears throat> Again, um, looking specifically at hospitals and their engagement in multi-sector community health networks. Uh, what we're learning about variation and change over time in uh, hospital engagement in these networks as, as mechanisms for aligning medical, social, and public health systems. <clears throat> uh, so uh, in, uh, uh, a lot of the research that our, our um, intramural research team based here at Colorado um, focuses in on is, uh, again, this, the study of multi-sector community networks as mechanisms for um, aligning delivery and financing systems that cut across the medical, 
social and public health sectors. And a lot of our work is really motivated by uh, the definition you see described on this, this slide that we're looking at, a definition that we've borrowed from the National Academy of Medicine and one of their um, reports uh, from several years ago on strategies for improve, improving population health. Um, and really using this definition of a, of a population health delivery system that um, National Academy of Medicine has put forward. Um, uh, and that definition um, called attention to these, these four important properties of systems that support activities that, in, that uh, can improve health on a population-wide basis. The first one being these are, are systems that are actually designed to achieve large-scale health improvement, not one patient at a time, but looking at ways of improving health for entire neighborhoods, communities, and regions. Uh, these are systems that look at uh, uh, not only uh, health status, uh, the overall health status for groups, but also look uh, importantly at difference in health status across subpopulations um, in, the, in the community from a health equity uh, perspective. Um, Thirdly, these are systems that uh, are really designed to address fundamental determinants of health and typically multiple determinants of health that go far outside of the clinical care system. So looking at social, economic, and environmental uh, determinants and contributors to health and looking at ways of intervening on those uh, non-medical um, determinants of health, if you will. Uh, and then finally, the fourth uh, and really essential piece of this definition of population health delivery system um, is the fact that the, the, these are systems that are designed to support collective actions across multiple organizations and sectors in the community, both governmental as well as private sector organizations. How you support collective actions across multiple actors in the community, uh, including the infrastructure that's needed to support uh, those actions, the information systems that are needed to inform and help to coordinate actions across organizations, as well as paying attention to the incentives both financial and non-financial, that can motivate uh, collective actions um, across across sectors. So this this definition has really guided a lot of our uh, the work that uh, we do in the coordinating center in studying uh, multi-sector community networks as as mechanisms for collective action. So some of the broad questions that we uh, our Colorado team pursues um, in this area. Um, again, in, in looking at community networks, we are interested in uh, understanding and being able to measure the strength of community networks that uh, exist to support population-wide health improvement activities at, at, a, at a local level. Um, uh, how, how strong are the networks that, that connect organizations together and help organizations work together around community health improvement activities using a variety of approaches and methods? Uh, secondly, our ability to understand how these community, uh, multi-sector community networks, how they change over time um, and vary across, across communities. Um, and then what I'll be talking about today specifically is, is looking specifically at the role of hospitals as, uh, as influential actors or anchor institutions in, in these networks uh, across communities. And then thirdly, and very importantly, uh, we're interested in understanding how these multi-sector networks uh, influence health, uh, important health and economic outcomes of interest, um, and understanding the mechanisms through which um, networks have, have those kind of effects. Um, again, and today I'm going to kind of zero in on the hospital sector and uh, share with you some work that we're doing looking specifically at the hospital sector and these networks. Uh, and in particular, two of the questions that we looked at and we're looking at now in the analyses that I'll be talking about today. Um, number one is understanding um, how uncompensated care costs uh, uh, that hospitals face, how that relates to hospital willingness and ability to contribute to community health networks. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this, this uh, uh, as well, but that's one you know, influential, very important public benefit that many community hospitals provide to their communities is providing free and reduced care for populations that are without health insurance coverage or that have uh, gaps you know, in, or that are under underinsured, that uh, provision of uncompensated care. And the question is, is as we've seen changes in the uh, demand for uncompensated care uh, over time in many communities because of gains in health insurance coverage, has that led hospitals to be more willing uh, to contribute to other kinds of community benefits through participation in, in community health networks and the, the areas in which they operate. Uh, so our question there is really, is, is there a, 
do hospitals substitute between these two forms of community benefit, uncompensated care and, uh, and engagement in community health, health networks? And as uncompensated care declines, do we see evidence of increases in, um, in hospital contributions to, to, to networks as, as other forms of, of community benefit? Um, and so, uh, so these are these are questions that um, that uh, we have we have several lines of research looking at these these kind of dynamics that I'll, I will um, step you through some of our uh, preliminary and emerging emerging findings um, on these issues here here today. Just a little bit more about the kind of the the rationale and the theory behind um, our exploration of of these topics. If we think about um, uh, what's likely to shape hospital decisions around their engagement and contribution to multi-sector uh, community health networks. Uh, there are a number of factors that are likely to shape uh, that, that kind of decision making about whether to and how much to, to invest you know, time and effort and money into, into uh, community health, health networks. Um, one has to do with hospital mission uh, and what's the mission of the organization. We know that we have uh, a range of, of, of different kinds of hospitals that operate uh, across the U.S. Uh, in terms of how they're organized as charitable, non-governmental uh, or non-profit organizations versus investor-owned for-profit hospitals. Um, obviously, the majority of hospitals, about two-thirds of community hospitals in the U.S. are organized as either government or and even more prevalently as not-for-profit, not uh, charitable uh, organizations. And so we might think that those um, uh, not-for-profit hospitals would be more likely to have a mission that's compatible with, um, with, the, goal of, with the goals of, um, of community health networks and those uh, hospitals organized as, you know, as non-profit organizations may be more likely to engage in community health networks and more likely to invest more time and effort and other resources in uh, the kind of community-wide health improvement activities that are supported by supported by networks. So mission is something you know that in terms of organizational structure is something that we uh, are you know pay attention to as a possible driver of of hospital decisions. Secondly, there are a range of pos of policies that uh, potentially could shape hospital decisions around engagement in these uh, in these uh, networks. Uh, Long-standing policies like uh, like in policy, um, like like Intala, um, which uh, um, it, which uh, is a federal federal law that requires um, hospitals uh, that offer um, emergency medical care to uh, to offer care regardless of um, patient ability to to pay, um, and so that's partly where the obligation of providing uh, uncompensated care and, and charity care comes from is the. The, uh, um, the need to comply with uh, with Mtala, um, and and as well as earlier policies like like Hill Hill, Hill Burton um, obligations that that they can obligate uh, hospitals to provide care regardless of of patient ability to care. They're also for hospitals that are um, organized as tax exempt uh, not for profit organizations. Uh, there um, is an again an, an an obligation to pr to produce a certain amount of community benefit um, that, um, uh, that in exchange for that for that tax exemption from federal, um, state, and potentially local um, local tax tax obligations. Uh, and those community benefit uh, regular regulations around community benefits can be promulgated at both um, state and and federal levels. Uh, we know that uh, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act back in 2010. Um, there were provisions of ACA that strengthened uh, some of the requirements uh, for uh, um, the community benefit requirements for tax exempt hospitals, particularly requirements around um, the, the, um, um, the need to conduct a, a community wide health assessments for their, um, the, their service areas um, uh, to be done in collaboration with community organizations, including uh, public health organizations. Uh, and the ability to periodically um, develop um, an implementation plan um, for for addressing community needs that were that are identified through the hospital um, community health needs assessment process. Uh, so those those heightened requirements uh, potentially could strengthen some of the, the, the incentives that hospitals, particularly tax exempt hospitals, face uh, to uh, contribute to community health networks and to contribute to the 
uh, community-wide health improvement activities that are supported um, by, by these networks. Um, and it's also possible that some of the payment incentives that have been introduced for, for hospitals um, uh, through the Affordable Care Act, as well as through other federal and state um, policy innovations could also uh, create some incentives for hospitals to uh, play a larger role in community health, health networks. Things like um, uh, the uh, hospital readmission reduction program that was uh, and implemented another component of ACA that um, creates some new financial incentives for hospitals to invest in activities that reduce the likelihood of patients being readmitted to the hospital after discharge. Um, that could create incentive for hospitals to invest in some of the community health infrastructure and community health initiatives that might um, uh, that might reduce the, the likelihood of patients being being readmitted. So, you know, investing in activities that could help to address um, uh, housing insecurity or food insecurity among discharged patients uh, that potentially could could play a role in, in reducing readmissions. That, uh, that could be in, um, a way in which payment incentives could influence hospital decision making around, around engagement um, in, in community uh, health, health networks. Uh, and so collectively, those, those kind of policies could create this, uh, um, this phenomenon uh, of crowding in, create, you know, um, um, encouraging more hospitals to engage in community health networks into the kinds of community-wide health improvement strategies that, that are supported there. Uh, the third factor that we're interested in studying, and that is how local market characteristics and market dynamics that, uh, that hospitals operate and how those market factors may influence hospital decision making around engagement in, in uh, community health, health networks. Uh, and um, mar hospital market characteristics are, you know, has, has been another area of both policy and economic interest, partly because of the continued patterns around hospital consolidation in many markets, uh, mergers and acquisitions um, among hospitals, you know, vertical uh, consolidation, uh, horizontal cons consolidation, as well as vertical consolidation as, as hospitals acquire uh, physician uh, organizations and, and other practices. And how those, how market changes in market competitiveness might affect the incentives that hospitals face to engage in, uh, in community health, health networks. And, and in this, um, for this dynamic, uh, you know, economic theory at least suggests that there might be a, kind of a, um, a incentives operating kind of in the opposite direction. That as um, um, as if markets become more competitive, that could actually create a disincentive for hospitals to engage in community health networks and collective actions to the extent that those networks uh, represent represent public goods. Um, and if there are more, more competitors in, in a market, uh, there may be, hospitals may be less likely to, to contribute to those public goods. There's a, a classic problem of uh, the free rider problem that, that is often um, discussed and studied in, in um, the economic uh, literature with, with ways in which com competitiveness can actually create a disincentive for organizations to voluntarily contribute to public goods. So that theory su could suggest that as, as hospital markets become more consolidated because of mergers and acquisitions, we might actually see uh, strengthening incentives for hospitals to engage in these community health networks because there's less of a free rider problem. Um, and the, the, uh, the public goods that are generated by collective actions and working in community health networks, uh, the, the benefits that are created um, by that work um, accrue more like private goods can accrue you know, to, the, to the individual hospitals that are helping to contribute to those activities. So, um, so these are some of the issues that kind of motivate our study of this issue, really understanding how the combination of policy changes and market changes may be, may be affecting the incentives that hospitals face uh, to, to engage in community health networks. Okay, so let me, let me get more uh, to some concrete elements of our study in terms of what data are we using to study these issues uh, and what are some of the analytic methods that, that we're using. Um, we, well, again, our, our team, our intramural research team uh, here at Colorado, um, a lot of our work in the Systems for Action program leverages a national longitudinal survey that we have been um, conducting now for, uh, for more than 20 years, uh, known as the National Longitudinal Survey of Public Health Systems. 
This is a survey that follows a nationally representative cohort of now about 600 communities across the U.S. Um, uh, that we've been following through periodic surveys that are done of uh, representatives in these communities uh, that began way back in 1998 um, and that we have been able to uh, follow, uh, repeat that survey periodically over time, uh, most recently through, uh, uh, through uh, calendar year 2018. We'll be going back in the field with the survey again later this year in 2020 uh, to pick up our 22nd year of um, uh, follow-up data with this, this national survey. Uh, so it's an interesting now and a pretty long panel of data that give us information about uh, about communities and specifically about the the structure, the composition um, of community health networks that exist that operate in these communities. Um, we survey local public health officials uh, in each of these communities. So that these uh, public health officials are our are our community representatives, our respondents that report to us information. Um, about the community health ne networks that operate in their in their local areas, uh, the survey has a series of questions that ask about twenty specific uh, population health activities that have been uh, widely recommended now by a number of national bodies, um, the National Academy of Medicine, as well as um, uh, other um, uh, other um, national bodies over time. These are activities that have been shown through both research and experience to be um, to be helpful in supporting collective actions, multi-sector collective actions around improving health at, at a community level. Um, and you'll be able to see some of the specific activities shortly that we measure on this survey. So we measure the extent to which each of these, these recommended population health activities are actually implemented in the community, um, in each of the communities that, that we survey. We also have questions that, that, uh, that ask about the range of organizations that contribute to each of those 20 population health activities, uh, both public and private sector organizations, organizations that are in, operate in the medical care and in the public health and the social services sector. Uh, so that information gives, allows us to characterize, again, the network of organizations that are working together on implementing recommended population health activities in, in their communities. Uh, and then we have some other measures that allow us to measure uh, some, some other network analytic properties like network centrality, the extent to which there's, a, there's kind of a backbone organization functioning as a coordinating agent uh, within, the, within the community, as well as we're able to measure, uh, we include some measures of the perceived effectiveness uh, 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 in implementing each of these recommended ac activities. Um, but this is the primary data source that we use for studying the, the structure and the composition of community networks that exist in each of these communities and how they change over time, both in terms of which organizations are involved in implementing which combination of activities um, measured, measured on the survey. <clears throat> uh, a little bit more about kind of the, the activities that we measure, as I mentioned, these, uh, these are nationally recommended uh, population ac health activities that generally are, are, um, are activities or capabilities that have been shown to be effective in helping to support multi-sector collective action initiatives in, in population health improvement. So we have measures that look at things like, um, are there activities in place to engage broad, uh, a broad range of stakeholders in um, community health assessment and, and planning activities? We look at uh, whether or not there are activities in place to regularly assess health needs and risks in the population that reside in that community. We look at uh, whether or not there are activities in place to identify evidence-based strategies for addressing health needs. Um, strategies for developing shared priorities and plans at, at the community level to, to, to address identified health needs in the population. Uh, importantly, we measure activities that um, are put in place to facilitate the sharing of financial and other resources across organizations in implementing collaborative health improvement activities. Uh, and then we measure um, whether or not there are activities in place to, to monitor and evaluate the impact of, uh, of community level health improvement activities and to feed that information back to the, the stakeholders in, involved in, in the network. Uh, so the 20 activities that we measure in the, in the survey all are based around these seven kind of um, uh, foundational capabilities in, in population health that have been advocated for a long time by bodies like the National Academy of Medicine, uh, CDC, Public Health Accreditation Board and, and, and other entities. Uh, 
Now we also, uh, we leverage that survey data for uh, conducting a variety of studies by linking that survey data with lots of other secondary data, existing data sources that tell us uh, about uh, other important aspects of community health resources that are available in each of these 600 communities. Um, and we link it with census data, demographic data, uh, data from the area health resource file. Uh, well, we can link our data with, uh, with um, uh, uh, data from CMS. It allows us to measure uh, things like hospital characteristics and market characteristics. And um, importantly for this study, hospital uncompensated care uh, delivery in each of these communities by linking our data with the, with the uh, CMS um, uh, cost report data. Uh, and as well as we've linked, we can link our data with um, uh, sources, uh, that, with data sources that, that give us measures of health outcomes in the community, like uh, CDC compressed mortality file that gives us measures of cause specific death rates um, at, at the county, county level, as well as some, some other uh, data sources. But, but for the analysis I'll, I'm sharing with you today, focus specifically on the, uh, on the CMS cost report data that we've linked our survey data to because that gives us measures of in hospital expenditures for, uh, for uncompensated care and how that might relate to hospital engagement in community health networks. Uh, just a little bit more on uh, detail I'll, I'll give you on the, um, how, um, how we measure properties of community health networks using our survey data. Um, our, our survey again captures um, uh, measures of, of implementation of a set of 20 core public health activities, and those are kind of represent the, uh, the columns that you see on this, on this um, slide, the activities one through 20, yes or no, is this activity being implemented in the community at the time of our survey? Uh, and then we also capture um, uh, indicators of the range of organizations that contribute to each activity. So that allows us, that gives us a matrix like what you see here, organizations by activities that tell us which organizations contribute to which, uh, which range of activities. Uh, we can take that, that matrix or what's also called a two mode network of organization type by activity and transform that into a traditional one mode network that is commonly used in, uh, in network um, analysis. Um, by looking at for every pair of organizations that is measured in our survey, how many of these activities are jointly produced or jointly implemented by each pair of organizations in the network. Um, and that, that measure of the number of activities jointly contributed by each pair or each dyad of organizations is our measure of the strength of the connection between that pair of organizations. The more activities that are jointly produced, in our survey, the stronger the connection um, between that pair of organizations. Um, that's, that's how we use our survey data uh, and really transform our survey data into measures of network strength, network composition and network strength by measuring the strength of the connections that exist between all the dyads, all the pairs of organizations that are working together on health improvement activities um, in, in each of the communities on our, in our survey. So with that data, we can generate interesting visuals like you see here, a classic um, uh, a, a network map diagram. We can visualize what the structure of the community health network looks like in each community. Uh, each of the boxes here that you see here represents a particular sector in the community, like hospitals, uh, community health centers, or physician organizations, health, uh, health insurers, employers, uh, nonprofits, and, and others, schools. Uh, and the, uh, the size of the box here is scaled based on essentially the, uh, uh, the centrality or the influence that that sector has in supporting uh, the uh, population health improvement activities in that, in that community. The width of the lines that connect each pair of sectors or organizations uh, is, uh, is scaled based on the strength of that connection between that dyad or that pair of organizations. And again, that's scaled based on the number of activities, the number of those 20 activities that are jointly contributed by each pair of organizations. So in this dyad, we see uh, pretty thick lines between um, hospitals on the right side and schools, for example. That means that a relatively large proportion of those 20 activities 
in this community were jointly contributed by both hospitals and schools um, in, in this community. Similarly, a thick line between schools and nonprofits, um, between local health departments and other units of local government. And you can see thinner lines that connect um, other, you know, other dyads, other sectors. And that means that those sectors are less strongly connected um, as measured by uh, having fewer, fewer activities that are jointly contributed by those, those organizations. So we can generate a network diagram like this for each of the 600 communities in our, um, in our survey um, for each time period. And we can look at how, how the structure of these networks, how they vary across communities, and how they change over time uh, by using each successive wave of a survey. And then by linking our survey data with, um, with other data sources, we can look at how these properties of the community health networks relate to, um, uh, to other you know, uh, important um, outcomes of interest at the community level. Um, one of the ways that we uh, analyze our data is by classifying communities or classifying networks uh, into categories based on um, the, the, the composition and structure of those networks. One kind of common way that we, we conduct analyses is um, based on these, these three classes of networks that you see here that we identified now going back about, um, about you know, analysis we did about 10 years ago uh, using um, latent class analysis uh, to basically group communities into one of three categories of networks based on the, the, the strength of, that, of the network. The highest category of networks we call comprehensive networks because they, they um, implement a broad range of those 20 uh, recommended activities that are included on the survey, and that's shown on the x-axis, and they, they support those activities through dense networks of contributing organizations. They engage, engage a broad range of contributing organizations in the network and helping to support those activities. Um, so if, you are, are, if you're a community that scores high on both the percent of activities performed and the density of contributing organizations, you would be classified as a comprehensive network according to our classification system. On the other end of the scale, the bottom of the scale, we have networks that we call limited networks. Uh, and they're classified as that because they implement a, a narrower scope of activity and they have a less, they, they, have, they engage less, uh, a narrower range of organizations in those, in those networks. And then in the middle we have uh, we have kind of the messy middle, middle uh, networks, what we call conventional networks that basically have support an intermediary uh, scope of activity and have, again, more intermediate levels of um, contributing organizations in, uh, involved. And so a lot of our analysis then tracks um, how the extent to which communities move, kind of move across these different classifications from comprehensive to conventional to narrow, uh, and then looking at what, what are some of the drivers of that change and what are some of the consequences of that, of that change as networks become more or less comprehensive over, over time. Um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, skip ahead, of, skip, skip over a few of these strides, slides so I can get more, get, get to the punchline in terms of um, uh, looking at hospital contributions. I will say, um, you know, for those of you who haven't been, been tracking this, uh, or are less familiar with this line of research that we've been doing over time. Uh, some of our prior work has actually uh, uh, studied the health impact that, th that is associated with changes in network composition over time. This is work uh, from a study we published a couple years ago now looking at changes in uh, mortality rates at the community level that are attributable to changes in the, the strength of the network that, that exists in that community. And again, we find uh, evidence of sizable reductions in mortality uh, for communities that over time move from less comprehensive to more comprehensive on our, on our classification system, uh, including pretty, pretty sizable reductions in preventable mortality rates um, over, over a, um, about a 16 year period of time, particularly for preventable mortality rates from chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and, and cancer, and even, even large effects for uh, an infectious disease like, like influenza mortality. Um, we've also done work to, uh, by linking our data with uh, uh, Medicare spending, spending data. We've shown that over time, communities that, that move to more comprehensive networks over time see lower rates of growth in Medicare spending over, over time, S significantly lower rates of growth in Medicare spending over, 
and whatnot, suggesting that there are potentially tangible economic benefits to communities building larger and stronger multi-sector networks that are supporting health improvement activities. That can have a, a, um, a beneficial effect on the long run, long run healthcare utilization and cost, at least in the, uh, in, in the Medicare program. That, that's work we've published now about a year ago, um, looking at kind of the economic benefits that may be attributable to changes in network composition. And then uh, work that we've done, we've presented at this session uh, earlier last year, we've taken a look at um, the effect of network composition on life expectancy across the income gradient to understand kind of the health equity dimensions of changes in multi-sector networks over time. Uh, this work, which is now in press, uh, we find that, again, communities that move to stronger networks over time see large and significant gains in life expectancy uh, for the, the um, for lower income populations, populations in the bottom 25% of the income distribution, uh, and even smaller but still positive effects on life expectancy for, for higher income populations. But the overall effect on um, is a significant reduction in the income related disparity in life expectancy, about a three year reduction in the disparity in life expectancy between high income and low income populations. Again, that's attributable to communities becoming stronger, more comprehensive networks um, uh, over time. So all this work has uh, um, led us to um, want to take a deeper dive into looking at the role of specific organizations in these networks. In particular, uh, our interest in understanding hospital contributions to these, these networks for a variety of reasons. Hospitals are, are large institutions. They have lots of resources. They are often influential in their community. Um, uh, and there are a variety of policy and market mechanisms that I talked about earlier that potentially may be sh uh, affecting uh, hospital incentives to engage in these, in these networks. Um, and this analysis, we've looked specifically at whether changes in hospital uncompensated care, uh, uh, have those changes, uh, whether that has had an effect on hospital engagement in these multi-sector networks so over time. In particular, as we've expanded health insurance coverage in many states through the Affordable Care Act, um, expansions, Medicaid expansions, as well as expansions in private health insurance, and that's caused for many hospitals a reduction in un uncompensated care. Has that led hospitals to increase their involvement in these community health networks because they are, they've, there's been resources that have been freed up um, because of a diminished need and demand for providing uh, free and reduced cost care for um, uninsured and under, underinsured populations. So to examine that, that approach, we estimated a panel regression uh, uh, model to estimate that relationship between hospital uncompensated care and hospital engagement in community networks. We use a two-stage instrumental variables method to estimate that relationship between uncompensated care and hospital engagement in networks to hopefully try to try to address some of the endogeneity, the unmeasured factors that may jointly influence uncompensated care and uh, network network characteristics. And we use as our instrument for that analysis whether or not the, um, the community is in a state that expanded uh, Medicaid um, as, a, as a major driver of change in, uh, in uncompensated care costs for, for hospitals. And uh, we do that while controlling for lots of other factors uh, in the market, in the community that, that might, might have independent effects on either uncompensated care or on the, the structure of, um, of the community networks that are operating in these, in these communities. Um, so let me show you some, some results. First of all, just, just looking at uh, kind of uh, what does the picture look like in terms of changes in hospital contributions to these, to these networks and to these population health activities and how hospital contributions compare to changes in other, other organizational contributions to these networks. Um, you can see the hospital role um, is in, this, in this slide, the hospital row um, is about uh, six rows down um, where we've seen, and these, these numbers are just looking at national averages for our entire cohort of, of um, communities over time. We have seen overall an upward trajectory in hospital engagement in community health networks and in community health improvement activities in our, in our survey. Over the 20 year period, uh, increase on average from 37% up to 46%. So almost a 10, um, about a nine percentage point increase uh, or a 25% relative increase um, in that uh, level of engagement or what we might consider the, the intensive margin of 
hospital engagement in, in these networks. But that's the broad national trend. It masks, masks lots of variation at, you know, across individual um, communities and, and, and over time. Just to get a sense of what that cross-sectional variation looks, looks like, uh, this slide just shows you a couple of different measures of network structure and how much variation we see in that network structure um, across communities. Just looking at our the most recent year of data in 2018, and the third uh, set of bars here look at specifically the, is a measure of hospital engagement in the network, a measure of hospital degree centrality, uh, one of the classic network analytic measures that we use for measuring, in this case, the hospital's influence on uh, the community health network that exists at the local level. And we see that, that measure of hospital centrality uh, varies from a low of about 5% to a high uh, of, um, of almost 40%. Um, so quite a, quite a bit of variation as we look across the, the 600, almost an eight-fold level of variation in hospital influence in the network as we look across the 600 communities in our, in our sample. Uh, so a lot of variation to kind of learn, learn from. Uh, if we look at then how that measure of hospital influence or hospital contribution to the network, how that's changed over time in relationship to changes in hospital uncompensated care, uh, you see the, the, the broad national patterns that are shown here on this on this line graph. Um, the orange line represents the um, uh, the community level uncompensated hospital uncompensated care cost per capita uh, in the average U.S. community, and we do see um, a pretty marked downward um, shift in that um, in uncompensated care cost per capita. Uh, centered around the, the um, time frame of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act's uh, coverage expansion initiatives, the Medicaid expansions and the uh, uh, operationalization of the um, private health insurance exchanges, a pretty substantial downward shift in uncompensated care costs. Uh, and that course roughly corresponds with a kind of a steady increase in hospital contributions to the community health network as measured by our, our measure of hospital uh, degree centrality in the, in the network. Um, so there does appear to be this, this inverse relationship between hospital engagement in the network and hospital uncompensated care costs. But we'd like to get a clear sense of whether that, whether that connection um, uh, is just a spurious collect, uh, connection due to uh, due other unrelated factors or whether there, some of that relationship might, might actually be causal in nature, that a reduction in uncompensated care demand might, might allow hospitals to redirect some of the resources into their engagement in community health networks. So that's where we use the panel uh, regression analysis with the instrumental variables estimation strategy to try to get a better sense of whether this, this relationship uh, could, could be causal in nature. This work is still preliminary, so I certainly don't, don't wanna draw any firm conclusions of, of causality, um, but this, this slide kind of shows you our, our main finding right now in terms of that relationship um, between uncompensated care cost in hospital contributions to their uh, community um, community health health networks, we do see a significant inverse relationship um, between uncompensated care and hospital network centrality. Basically, um, and that's what, what we're seeing specifically in the uh, in the dark blue um, bar graph that, that you see on this slide. Uh, um, our model shows that a, a ten percent in ten percent decrease. Uh, in hospital uncompensated, uncompensated care costs is associated with about a 27% increase in hospital network centrality, or a 27% increase in hospital engagement in their community health network uh, and in the set of, uh, of health improvement activities supported by that network. So a si significant inverse relationship there, suggesting that, you know, um, particularly given that this is estimated with with an instrumental variables technique that's designed to wash away you know, potential confounding factors in this relationship, this, this uh, is at least preliminary evidence of a, of a possible causal effect that hospitals that have seen reductions in their uncompensated care uh, demand um, appear to have been, have, to have significantly increased their engagement in their, uh, in their local community health, health network and the set of activities there. Uh, the second finding that I'll, uh, I'll highlight here, also still preliminary at this, fray, fl fl at this stage, looks at a, uh, a second driver that I had mentioned earlier, a second potential driver of 
hospital motivations around engagement in community health networks. And that is the structure of the hospital uh, market. Uh, we use a, a measure of hospital market competitiveness um, known as the Hurstmandal Index, a common way of measuring uh, the level of competition in the, in, the hospital, um, uh, in the hospital network. That's an additional variable that we use in the analysis in that uh, regression model uh, that is explaining um, variation and change in hospital engagement in, in the community health network. Uh, and we find there um, that uh, a 10% increase in the Herfindahl index, which is a measure of concentration, market concentration, that results in about a 35% increase in hospital engagement in, in their community health networks. So as networks become more concentrated, less competitive, uh, we see hospitals becoming more engaged, investing more, contributing more in, in their um, local community health, health network. And that's consistent with that kind of public goods, free rider economic theory that I had mentioned earlier. Um, in more competitive markets, the, the public good of community health networks becomes more of a private good to that hospital. And if there are economic benefits from contributing to strong community health networks in, uh, in a less competitive market, the hospital that's doing the work gets to reap more of the benefits if it results in, in lower costs or lower readmissions or lower hospital length of, lengths of stay that results in, in savings to the hospital. Again, consistent with that kind of public, public goods theory in, in economics. So these are preliminary estimates at this stage. Uh, uh, we're still, you know, um, doing um, additional checks on on, uh, uh, on these models and, and estimates, and um, uh, to kind of really understand um, uh, the, the drivers of, of these these effects, and also doing a, um, uh, some pretty careful um, looks at uh, at sensitivity analysis, and also looking at sub subgroups of, of communities to see whether these same um, these same relationships play out in different types of communities, rural versus urban, uh, you know, more advantaged, uh, you know, resource advantaged versus less, more resource poor environments and, and others. But, but um, at least it, preliminarily, these are some interesting findings for us that uh, each, uh, shedding some, some new, new light potentially on uh, hospital incentives for engaging in multi-sector community health networks uh, and the roles of both policy and market incentives in um, in shaping that um, shaping those decisions. So, again, in conclusion, uh, we we find again not surprisingly that hospitals are major contributors to uh, to community health networks that exist in most communities. In fact, they're the, they tend to be the largest non governmental contributors to uh, to health improvement activities in the in the community health networks that are included in our in our survey over time. And those, those hospital contributions have, have increased significantly over, over time, and particularly in the area, in the, in the time period after 2014, after we've seen these major gains in coverage, especially in states that expanded um, uh, Medicaid coverage. There does appear to be a strong association between reductions in hospital uncompensated care and increases in hospital contributions to these community health, health networks, particularly after we use more advanced uh, econometric techniques to, to wash away some of the confounding factors and the endogeneity that might may be a part of that. Although we still we still got analyses underway to kind of better understand these models, their um, their robustness and their their sensitivity to the specifications that we're that we're making. Uh, and the the other related finding I mentioned that's, that gets intriguing is that there does appear to be a relationship between market structure and hospital engagement in these networks that are consistent with kind of a public goods. A free free rider uh, mechanism. Uh, hospital contributions to these networks are significantly larger in more concentrated markets and markets that become concentrated over time. So we see larger gains in hospital contributions to these networks. Again, more work to understand that dynamic as well um, in this analysis. Um, so again, this is research in progress, preliminary, not yet published. We still have more work to do. Um, but these, these findings, again, if they hold up, I think they, they do have some important implications for future uh, policy and practice around how we strengthen multi-sector work across, um, particularly across medical care, social and public health uh, sectors in, um, in this area. Um, this work could certainly have implications for future policies around uh, hospital community benefit standards. Um, as well as um, you know, policy implications for how we think about 
hospital consolidation and both its um, advantages and disadvantages for communities in terms of um, th this kind of work. Uh, there are some implications in terms of hospital closures and the effects they may have on these networks over time. We've got some uh, analyses underway to look at that, uh, those issues, as well as understanding the effects that changes in payment models and in incentives may have uh, on, on these networks and on, on hospital contributions. So I see we're down to about our last 10 minutes, so I'm going to stop here and see if we've got some questions to entertain. Um, and Chris and Carrington, I would love your help if, if you can help me navigate or at least call my attention to questions we may, we may have. And again, welcome you to type in any comments or questions in the chat box if you're with us on the web portion of today's webinar. Sure, uh, so we've got a couple questions. Um, we have three. Uh, let, let's start with one from uh, John Shaw. Uh, he's asking, did patterns differ between nonprofit and for-profit hospitals? Good question. I think that the short answer is yes, they appear, they appear to. For this analysis that, that, we're, that I presented to today, we're carrying out at, at a community level, the way we get at that, we, we do have some other some measures of uh, basically hospital market share segmented by for-profit versus non-profit. Um, and we do, there do, does appear to be a, um, a tendency for stronger hospital contributions in communities where, where non-profit hospitals really have the dominant market share in their, in their, in their communities. And so that does, that the, that's the issue of mission uh, hospital mission and structure do, does appear to be a, another important driver. I didn't really highlight that finding in this analysis, but um, but that is that's an excellent question, and we, we do see some support for that. And I, I think a good transitional question, um, one from Gary uh, Gannon. I uh, hope I'm not ruin, messing up your last name there. Uh, but yes, do you have any observations about best practices that improve the strength of community networks and hospital centrality? Great question. Uh, and I can't, I can't do it justice in just a few minutes, but I would say yes. Our, our work, at least in, the, in terms of the, the activities that are measured on our survey, there seem to be three elements that are particularly important in helping communities build stronger networks and engage a broader range of stakeholders in those networks, including hospital engagement. One has to do with the, the strength of the governance structures that are put in place to support these networks. And uh, principles for you know, in inclusive governance and open governance um, uh, appear to be particularly um, uh, uh, useful in helping to attract a larger density of organizations in, uh, into the network. Um, so giving, giving network participants a voice uh, in the governance of, of the collaborative through inclusive governance mechanisms. That would be one. A second would be having explicit mechanisms for sharing financial resources across the organizations that are contributing to the network. We have a specific measures of that, of resource sharing in our survey. That appears to be a very influential aspect of the network and of growing the network in terms of its composition and, and density. So sh mechanisms for shared financing. The third would be having explicit mechanisms for measuring progress and feeding back progress to, to network members. That kind of evaluation, um, you know, network evaluation and feedback mechanisms would, is a third practice that appears to be um, associated with networks becoming stronger uh, over time in terms of their contributor contributions from hospitals as well as through, from other sectors. Great question. There's more I could say on that, but we, we can talk, talk offline as well. Uh, so in uh, the, the interest of time, uh, Glenn, I'll give you one easy question and uh, one more in-depth one uh, for, for, for you to, to, to take, a, take a bite at. Um, the first is uh, from Charlene uh, Altenhein. Uh, she just wants to know if the survey results are available publicly. The results are available and the actual data are available publicly. This is a shared resource that we create through the Systems for Action Research Program. We make the data available to any other research teams who may want to use it in their research and uh, their studies. Um, uh, you can contact us at Systems for Action, uh, the email account, 
and we're glad to um, share information how you, how you can access the data and, and the results. Awesome, and, and Douglas McCarthy uh, wants to know, uh, given that greater hospital market concentration is associated with higher commercial healthcare prices, might the association between market concentration and community health networks imply that communities must pay an economic price to gain the benefit of hospital engagement in community health networks? Well said, my friend, well said. Um, that is precisely one of the implications of, of, of this finding. Um, we obviously want to do a, some deeper dives into that, that relationship um, to really understand what, what may be, um, be, be driving it, including seeing whether we can bring in some measures of, of prices into our data set to see if uh, we can separately control for prices, see how much of this you know, may, may be driven by that. But that is certainly one reasonable interpretation um, is that concentrate. we know from a lots of good research that markets becoming more concentrated definitely raises prices and so there's an economic price we all pay taxpayers and users of services from concentration um, and that that may be the price that we pay to uh, partly strengthen incentives that hospitals face to to engage in these networks whether it's a price worth paying is the price is, is the, the cost of this consolidation uh, justified by the benefits of stronger networks that's a question we haven't yet examined and would require us to look carefully at the magnitude of the changes that we see and that's that's a direction that we certainly are are, um, are, are moving in now uh, but um, excellent observation thank you for that and uh, so so we've got about four minutes do you want to take an additional question Glenn yeah I I'll see that uh, other question that John, just, John Snow just popped up about health plan involvement in these sectors. So, um, yeah, in this analysis, I didn't, you know, look at specifically health plan engagement in these networks, but we do measure that in our survey. We do have some other analyses underway. My, my colleague, I should mention, um, one of my longstanding colleagues, uh, Rachel Graham, actively involved in this line of research and around hospital engagement in these networks. She actually has her own um, K award from AHRQ to examine more on a more granular level hospital engagement in these networks. She also has, has started some uh, lines of research looking at health insurer and health plan engagement in the networks and whether, and, and their connection, and that, that connection to hospital um, engagement as well. So we have uh, our larger team, including work that Rachel is leading, um, is beginning to look at that, at this issue. Uh, we've, you know, our data source provides one lens for looking at it, uh, but there's a lot more work we can, we can do in the space as well. Um, so good question. I don't have any findings to give you yet, but I can say we, we are, um, several of us have, have those analyses underway to start looking at that. And uh, one final question, and, and Glenn, you can bring us home. Um, anonymous attendee uh, would like to know uh, where the theories that might explain uh, the increase in hospital contributions uh, to CHNs post ACA. Yeah, I mean, our interpretation, our, our hypothesis is that it, it's the combination of coverage gains uh, that are freeing up resources that hospitals used to expend for uncompensated care. Now, uh, so there's additional resources that, uh, that hospitals potentially have that they can invest in, in, in their network contributions. That combined with, with the heightened um, community benefit regulations that were brought in through the IRS were quite IRS components um, uh, around reporting and you know conduct the requirement to conduct a community health needs assessment and to create an implementation plan. Our theory is that that combination of freeing up uncompensated care resources combined with the greater scrutiny around community benefit activities for non-for-profit hospitals, that's what's driving creating the incentive for hospitals to spend a little more time and effort contributing to their community health networks. Um, uh, again, that's just, a, we've got some preliminary evidence suggesting that we, we need to take a deeper dive on that and, and are, are, um, are doing that. I know that other, we've got other colleagues around in, in the S3A program as well as elsewhere who are looking at these same issues from some other lenses as well. Uh, but that's, that's at least our tentative, uh, tentative hypothesis at this stage, that combination of, um, of financial incentive and regulatory incentive may, may be what's driving it. 
Great questions. Thank you so much for the questions. And if you have other ideas or feedback for us, don't hesitate to use the email address you see on the slide, my email address or our, our larger program. We'd love, love to hear from you. And so with that, I will just say thank you so much uh, for joining us. Again, we do this about every two weeks, so uh, check the website for our next Research and Progress webinar. Um, we look forward to hearing from you, and um, please, please stay in touch. Thank you so much, everybody.